All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, so we really appreciate you tuning in on YouTube as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities from around the globe. Today, we are joined for the very first time by Dr. David Sills, who is the Executive Director, Director of the Northern Tornadoes Project. He spent decades in pursuit of severe weather and natural phenomena, trying to understand twisters, one of the most amazing things that happen on our planet. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sills. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and take it away. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about the wild side of weather. So this is uh, severe storms and tornadoes and that kind of thing. Uh, just a bit about me. I was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, down in the, the deep south of Canada, and there's lots of severe weather that occurs around there. So uh, I was fascinated by storms as a kid. And I decided in high school that I wanted to be a severe weather forecaster. So I went, to, went away to university, York University in Toronto and uh, graduated. But uh, right when I graduated, there were no forecasting jobs available. So what to do? Uh, I ended up going into research and studied severe weather, especially how the Great Lakes uh, affect severe weather and things like tornadoes. And uh, when I graduated from that, in 1998, then I was hired by Environment Canada, which is uh, the government weather agency, to be a severe weather scientist. And that's when my, my real career began. Uh, so one of the first things I did when I was a severe weather scientist with Environment Canada was uh, there were the Olympics in Sydney, Australia in 2000. And they were having a kind of a forecasting Olympics to go along with the athletic Olympics. And while I was there working with with this and, and, uh, and dealing with the forecasting systems, there was a, a really strong storm that came up uh, right out the window of the forecast office. And that's what this picture is. This is a, a big storm that came up and produced a tornado. It was actually the first tornado I'd ever seen. And that was in Sydney, Australia. So that was, that was a bit unusual for the first tornado you, you've ever seen if you were from, uh, from Canada, is seeing one in, uh, in Australia. And of course, it does turn the other way. Um, but I went on to, uh, to continue working on how the Great Lakes influence severe weather and tornadoes. And this is a photo from inside of a research aircraft looking down at the Lake Huron shore and the, the edge of the lake air coming in from Lake Huron and causing the development of clouds. And those can develop into thunderstorms and, and severe weather. So that's what that whole project was about. It was the effects of lake breezes on weather project in 2001, the elbow. And uh, again, here I am in the aircraft. You can see the wing of the aircraft as we're flying back and forth across this, uh, this feature. Another program that I participated in uh, as a severe weather scientist was uh, this project called Baxmet. So it was, it was talking about air quality, but also meteorology in, uh, in Southern Ontario in 2007. And uh, here's uh, myself with uh, one of the students that I had working with me at the time. You can see we had a, a car that was outfitted with the whole weather station and making measurements in the vicinity of storms. And you can see this really huge storm that came up uh, just, just about an hour east of Windsor. And uh, we really thought that was going to produce a tornado. But in the end, it just, it just was a lot of rain and, and looked very impressive. But uh, something that, that happened that we weren't expecting that day. So we got some interesting data from that one. And then in 2008, we did the, pretty much the same project again, but in Alberta this time, where it's really difficult to forecast storms because of the, the Rocky Mountains that are on the west side of Alberta. So this was a project called Unstable. And we're out there again with, uh, with vehicles like this one and, uh, and, and trying to figure out what causes thunderstorms to develop in this region. One of the more interesting projects I was involved in was a project called Vortex, which was a study of, of tornadoes in the US, uh, United States, and how they form. And you can see all of the different vehicles that were instrumented. And, and uh, we had radars on, on trucks, and we had mobile labs, and all of this equipment that just uh, every day we were in a different place trying to figure out where the storms would be, and then, and then surrounding the storms with all of these different uh, measurement platforms. And this is our, our vehicle here that we brought uh, down for this project. And you can see 
uh, we're, we're in the area of a big, big thunderstorm here and there's a tornado down the road and we're making measurements with our vehicle. Uh, some of these are, are vehicles that we're me making measurements. Other, other vehicles here are just vehicles that are trying to get the heck out of the way uh, because there was this tornado forming. And uh, one other uh, interesting thing from that project is we, you know, a lot of large hail with these storms. Here's an example of a, a big hailstone. Uh, this was about 55 millimeters, so bigger than a golf ball, maybe it's just smaller than a tennis ball. And the interesting thing is you can see all these spikes coming off of the hail. So as the hail was rotating, as it was coming out of the thunderstorm, all of the, the wet rain was, was being flung off the stone and freezing. And that's what all these little uh, spikes are. And this is after it had melted somewhat. When it first fell, the spikes were really long and sharp and definitely you wouldn't want to get hit by one. Uh, a more recent project I had with Environment Canada was the Pan Am Games in Toronto. So this was kind of like an Olympic style games uh, in, in the Toronto area. And we set up a whole bunch of weather uh, instrumentation uh, to help with the forecasting for that, that uh, event. One of the things we set up was a network of these uh, lightning detectors. So we had a network of 14 lightning detectors across Southern Ontario and, and around the Toronto area. And they were really simple, just uh, solar powered and uh, worked with a GPS and sent, um, sent signals back and forth to cell towers. And this is the antenna that picked up the little tiny bits of energy that are, are made up of when a, a lightning flash occurs or a lightning strike. And um, we got some really interesting data because it tries to capture all of the, all of the um, you know, how, how a lightning flash looks in 3D, uh, each, each lightning flash. So it tries to capture the entire lightning flash as you see it forking through the sky. And uh, one of uh, our chasers in Southern Ontario, David Piano, got this great image of this thunderstorm over, uh, over Lake Ontario and then this lightning coming out through it, uh, from it. And so we tried to just go through our data to find that, that particular lightning flash. And this is the data that we get from this network. And you can see that we did find it. Uh, this is a bit complicated. So this, is, this is what the lightning looks like as you go through time. And then this is what it looks like when you're looking over top of it. And these are from the side. So looking over top of it, you can see that it's, the lightning starts in the cloud right in about here and then expands out. And this part is the part that uh, went from the lake over to the land and hit land. So this, this actual bit of lightning here is this one here. And then the rest of this is spread out into the front of the thunderstorm over time. Uh, as, as you can see over time, it turns more in a red color. So that was going out from the, to the front of this thunderstorm where you can't even see it. So there's a lot of things going on in a thunderstorm with lightning that we could, were able to pick up with this network which is just incredible, uh, the detail that you can get for every flash that occurs, uh, lightning flash. Something else I've done for a long time is uh, survey tornado damage. So get out and actually uh, classify and rate the kind of damage that occurs with tornadoes. And this was an event in uh, Godrich, Ontario back in 2011 where an F3 tornado came in from over Lake Huron and you can kind of see it buried in rain here it came in and hit Goderich, Ontario. And that's the kind of damage that we saw. There was, there was a lot of damage right through the center of town. Um, and uh, we had to, the, the, actually the tall town was closed off and only a few people were allowed in. So it was kind of eerie being in there when there were no people around and uh, it was just us looking at all the damage through the city. And then more recently in 2018, there was a big tornado event through the Ottawa area and that, again, that was F3. Uh, in, this, in this case, in Godrich, the tornado was out over the water. It was hard to see. In this case, the tornado is right here. There's a little bit of a funnel cloud coming down from the storm. And then this flash here is where there's damage occurring and power lines are exploding. And there's not much of a connection between the two, but there is a lot of wind obviously being generated here that you can't see. So sometimes you don't get a classic funnel cloud like I'll show you in a video coming up in a bit. But again, here we are looking at all the damage that's occurred uh, with this particular tornado as it crossed this, uh, this urban area of Ottawa and caused a lot of problems. So how do we rate a tornado? What, what do we use uh, to know how strong a tornado is? 
Well, tornadoes are rated by the damage that they cause, and it's using a scale that uh, was pioneered by Dr. Ted Fujita in the United States. And up until 2012, we used the Fujita scale or F scale. And so it was ratings from F0 to F5, and the wind speeds and the damage would increase as you go from F0 to F5. Uh, scientists got together and thought that the wind speeds were too, too high with the F scale. And so they came up with this enhanced F scale, EF scale. And so now we use the same amounts of damage, but now the wind speeds assigned to that damage are a little less. So the only way we know how strong a tornado is is by the damage it causes. And, that's, and we use the EF scale to rate how strong a tornado is. Uh, and then once we do that, we can draw a map up of all the tornadoes and how strong they are across the country. So you can see this is uh, Canada here. And uh, we have two main corridors of activity uh, in Canada. One is down from Windsor, where again, I was born and raised and lots of activity down there. And then up through Quebec and into the Maritimes. And then you've got another corridor that's out in the West. And uh, it goes out uh, from Southern Manitoba through Saskatchewan and then into Alberta. And there's been some really big tornadoes out that way. And I've, I'm, I'm highlighting two of them here because I'll be talking about them a bit more. One is the Eli F5 tornado. So it's the only tornado in Canada that actually went up to the very top of the scale, the five. Another one is a really high impact tornado, uh, the Edmonton tornado. And if we look at the Can Canada's worst recorded tornado events, you can see that uh, there's been events where there's been 19 tornadoes in one day. Uh, some of them are 17 or 14. A lot of them have occurred in, in southern Ontario or Quebec, and then some other ones have occurred in that other corridor, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, Canada's worst recorded tornadoes, you can see here, a lot of them are the F4s, and uh, they cause the most uh, fatalities and injuries and damage to buildings and that kind of thing. But Canada's strongest recorded tornado, again, is that Eli Manitoba F5 tornado that was back in 20, uh, 2007. And, for, and very luckily, there was no one that was, was killed or, and just a few injuries from that one. So it doesn't show up in the worst recorded tornadoes, but it is our strongest tornado on record. And now I'm going to show you uh, some, of the, some video from, from those tornadoes in Edmonton and, and Eli. This one was actually shot by my cousin, believe it or not. It's the most famous video of, uh, of the Edmonton tornado. I hope this works. Uh-oh. I'm not sure why that's not working. Uh, let me see if I can. We're good for time, so play with it for a second. Yeah. Get it. That's hilarious that your cousin was a filmer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Not sure why that's not playing. Um, let me try. Stepping out just for one second yeah. and playing it this way. Cannot play. Well, that's too bad. Um, Send it to me after the fact and we'll put it in the YouTube chat bar in the comment section. <laughs> Check out the video. It's unfortunate, but so it goes. Okay, okay. Let me get back to uh, my presentation then. Um, and then this one was the Eli Manitoba F5 tornado. And you can see a bit of it here. It actually was very slow moving and circled around and in through this factory in the neighborhood and actually took a house and, and, and took up the entire house and brought it up in the air. And then another big vehicle through the air. And uh, once you see the video, you'll be able to see how incredible that is. David, sorry to bother you. Right now we've got your slide deck and the Edmonton Journal Tornado Ravages City still up on your screen for some reason. Okay. The screen here being iffy. Uh, Okay. I'll let you know where Neli. Is it showing up there? No, still, still stuck on Edmonton Journal. Okay, hang on one second. Take your time. I'm back here. It's back to you. We're back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all the great work. technology. And, uh, yeah, it has to have something go a little wrong. Again, otherwise, no fun. For everyone tuning in at home, while we're getting this back working, um, just get ready with questions. I look forward to having you guys type in anything you're interested in in the chat bar. So now it, it seems to really like this Edmonton Journal Tornado Ravage a City clip now. And it's stuck okay. there. Um, okay. There we go. Northern Tornado just pro Oh, it, then oh. it popped up. 
I don't know. Then it's a okay, Northern Okay, I will try it. Second, try it again. <laughs> Third time's a charm. I mean, it's a it's a saying and everything. So tell right me now, that word. I will tell you. Perfect. You're back. back okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So after all of that work uh, at Environment Canada in the last year, I decided to take a new job at Western University. And I'm the executive director of a new project called the Northern Tornadoes Project. And the main goals here are to find out how many tornadoes really occur across Canada, because we know that uh, since Canada has a lot of pop, uh, places that aren't highly populated, don't have a lot of people in them, uh, a lot of tornadoes don't get seen. So we're trying to get an idea of how many torn tornadoes really occur across Canada and trying to detect every one that develops across the entire country. Uh, something else that we're trying to do is come up with new ways of detecting tornadoes, because obviously if you want to get every one, you have to try every way to, to detect these tornadoes. So once we have all of that data, then we can help improve severe weather warnings. We can make sure that Canadians know that tornadoes can occur where they live, because a lot of Canadians think that tornadoes are something that doesn't happen in Canada. It happens in the United States. Uh, and, and obviously that's not true. We get lots of tornadoes in Canada and also understand, help us understand how our climate is changing. Uh, so what do we use to tornado detection tools? Um, one of the things that I mentioned before was doing ground surveys. So going out to the actual site and looking at the damage that, that has occurred. In this case, in this, in this town in Quebec, this house was lifted right off its foundation and pushed into the bush here. We can also look at satellite data. So these are satellites that are way above the earth and you can see that the, it leaves the, when the tornado occurs, it leaves a long, narrow scar in the forest. And that's something we can look for in the satellite imagery. If we want to get even closer, we can use a drone to fly over the damage. And you can see the individual trees there. And in places where we can't fly a drone because uh, it's just too far away from roads, we actually get aircraft to fly over. And they can collect data that you can see trees as well. So we've got lots of ways to, to look over areas that have had damage and uh, try to identify where tornadoes have occurred. Uh, actually, last summer, we had a, a high school student. He had just graduated from high school. And uh, we said, uh, he was an intern with us. And we said, you know, it'd be really nice if we could automatically find the, the trees that have come down in, in images that we have from all of these satellite and, and uh, aircraft images. So he tried to work on a program that uh, looked for trees in the imagery and, uh, and it worked pretty well. He, he was able to, to get an, a program together that actually looked and found all of the trees that were down in an image. So, uh, you know, and he was just out of high school. So we were really impressed with that work and it just tells you what, you know, is possible with computers and artificial intelligence to be able to, uh, to find these things and, and help us find tornadoes. Some other engineering projects that are interesting at Western University in London, where I am, there's the Three Little Pigs site where they actually build a house and then they try to blow it down uh, just to determine where the weak points are in the construction and, uh, and, and where, what a hurricane or a tornado might be able to do to a house. And then there's also a, a huge dome that they've built that actually simulates tornadoes in the dome. So it's called the Windy Dome. And, uh, and you, can, you can do, uh, you can simulate a tornado. Usually they're, they're not quite as large as the real thing, but uh, they, they can spin up as fast as the uh, EF3 tornado. So that's really impressive. It's the only one in the world like it. And the last thing, and I'm not sure if you can see that, but it says storm chasing. And uh, so not only do I do this for, uh, for my work, but I also do this as part of, uh, you know, my vacations and that kind of thing. And back in 2004, that was the first time I'd gone on a storm chasing trip with a bunch of friends and, uh, and saw tornadoes in the United States. Uh, in 2005, this was a group of us in Southern Ontario, the Southern Ontario Storm Chasers. And uh, some of these people are, are, have gone on to bigger things like George Karunas now is on the Angry Planet show, uh, television show, and chases volcanoes and tornadoes and all kinds of stuff. Um, back with uh, the Storm Hunter from the Weather Network. He and I went on a chase in 2005 in the United States. This was our group looking at uh, doing a tornado chase in the Canadian prairies in 2006. Uh, in 2016, I took my son out for the first time. We went and uh, uh, did some storm chasing in the northern US Plains and tried to get some tornadoes, but uh, 
instead we got some really good uh, video and fo photos of these really beautiful storms that are producing hail that gives it that green color there and lately uh, la uh, I guess 2018 uh, just uh, just 10 minute drive from my house I was chasing a storm and and, uh, and managed to find a tornado on it and got it with my uh, my uh, dash cam on my car so all kinds of ways you can uh, experience tornadoes either for work or for fun and uh, so this has pretty much been my life uh, since since I was a kid uh, getting into severe weather and uh, pursuing it through my education and even doing it for fun and uh, so that's it uh, I'd like to uh, like to open it to questions if uh, Jesse can handle that yeah, well, I hope so. I'm going to try my best. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sills. What a cool presentation. For anyone tuning in at home, I've never seen a satellite picture of a tornado take out for us like that. That was super neat. And the, the <laughs> lightning model to show it uh, in its entirety is fantastic. How neat. Um, so yes, as, as Dr. Sills said, if anyone wants to type in questions in the chat bar on YouTube, I'll take as many as we can in our time remaining. In fact, we have one right off the bat from Scarlett, and she wants to know, do you ever get scared when you're on the job? Oh yeah, you you have to treat uh, these storms with a lot of respect, and um, you know sometimes you usually when you know what you're doing out there, you can try to be in the right place and not be uh, not not get into a position where you're not safe. And uh, sometimes a, a storm will do something that's you just couldn't see coming, and you'll be in the wrong place, and you need to get out fast in order to not be in a dangerous spot. So yeah, there, there are some kind of heart pounding moments when you're chasing, um, but most of the time, actually when you're chasing, most of the time is just waiting because it, the chasing part is only about maybe, you know, a small portion of your entire day. The rest of it is forecasting, getting to the area, waiting for a storm to come up. So it's, it's really just kind of quick and you have to make a lot of quick decisions. And uh, if, you, if you know about storms, then you can usually make those decisions, decisions pretty well. If you're a total newbie and you're out there just trying to have fun, uh, you can get into trouble very fast. So we recommend that if anybody's going to storm chase, you really should know your stuff as far as uh, you know how storms work and storm safety and that kind of thing. Lightning is actually even the most dangerous thing. Being close to storms is, is uh, the lightning is the most dangerous thing. Yeah, we've had Mark Robinson on from Storm Hunters on the Weather Network, and he always highlights that that's the thing that he fears the absolute most is, is lightning strikes. Um, you mentioned that you go to these sites and you highlight or you try and discover the, the scale of the damage of the tornado. What are you looking for? Those, those scales are incredible damage, devastating damage. Those are very vague terms. So what, what determines that when you're assessing it? Sure. I mean, a lot of times we go out and uh, most tornadoes are weak tornadoes. And you go out and you might have a couple shingles off or a tree down or a bench knocked over or something like that. It's, and those are the weakest, the, you know, the zeros, right? Um, but then sometimes uh, you get events, usually every year we get a, a few events where a roof is taken off a house or a barn is completely demolished or there's a path of trees that are completely down through a forest and those are two, two levels, so EF2. When we start getting higher than that, then you start getting houses coming apart and uh, with the Eli tornado, the, the entire house was lifted into the air and thrown. And that's the highest level of damage when the house isn't even, it doesn't even exist anymore after the tornado has gone through. Fantastic. Um, so you showed all these vehicles uh, that you're chasing storms with and you've got radar trucks, you've got normal vans. Do you have any armored vehicles? Like what happens if one of these vehicles gets caught in a storm? Do you have anything that could withstand that sort of force or, or not? Well, uh, the object when, when I'm storm, chase, storm chasing is to not be in the middle of the tornado. I like to view it from a distance and that, you know, that's what they make zoom lenses for, for cameras, right? Is, you know, you stay away and you get a nice zoom shot. Um, but there are people uh, who, who, who've uh, developed armored cars and their, their goal is to get into the tornado and make measurements from inside. It's trying to get data that no one else can get from inside of a tornado. And uh, so obviously you have to build your vehicle very strongly. And there have been a, a, a couple people who have done this and, and built these big armored vehicles and uh, have gone through tornadoes. There's been movies about it. So if you look online, you'll find them. Uh, the, the tornado intercept vehicle is one of them. Um, and there was a movie that involved it. And, and so, yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different people doing different things as far as storm chasing. Most people are out there trying to get an idea 
get an idea of how storms work and kind of being in awe of nature. Other people are trying to collect data in the area of a thunderstorm. Other people are trying to get data from inside of a tornado. So, you know, obviously there's different risks with each of those types of activities. Yes, needless to say. And scary hail, I've never seen hail quite like that. That was fantastic. Um, how many tornadoes have you seen in your storm chasing career total? I don't actually know anymore. <laughs> it's somewhere about more than a dozen, but um, what I find more interesting is I've, I've been able to see I've been able to see tornadoes in Canada, in the United States, and Australia, so three different countries. And uh, there's not not a lot of people that are able to say that. Uh, I only know off of, off top of my head about maybe half a dozen people in the world who've been able to see tornadoes in multiple countries like that. And uh, in Australia, like I said, it turned the other way uh, because that's in, in the southern hemisphere, the, the forces that, that uh, produce tornadoes and produce weather systems work in the opposite way. Uh, so it was really interesting to see the, a tornado and a storm spin the other way in the southern hemisphere. Very cool. Um, all right, we've got a question from someone in Ottawa and they want to know how damaging was the storm that hit Ottawa uh, not too long ago? Yeah, well, it was an outbreak of seven tornadoes uh, very late in the year. So it was late September, which was pretty unusual. Uh, and that hasn't happened in 100 years where we had a strong tornado. Uh, the, the top tornado was, was EF3. And uh, that was really late in the season. Uh, some of the other tornadoes were EF2 and EF1. But the one that went uh, fairly close to Ottawa uh, through Dunrobin and through Gatineau, that was rated EF3, and there were houses that were completely taken down by, by that tornado, um, and so it was some serious damage. Very cool. Um, all right, we've got a guy who wants to know, he wants to go to school, and he wants to find the best universities to go for meteorology. Um, London with that windy dome looks like it could it take the cake. That was a pretty cool looking facility, but is there anywhere you'd recommend uh, to someone that wanted to learn meteorology in Canada? Yeah, it's uh, it, it, at London, there's actually not a meteorology program at London. It's an engineering program. And so the people at London are in London are actually looking at kind of the engineering aspects of the damage and uh, like how much wind does it take to cause this amount of damage and that kind of thing. Not so much about the weather systems and how to predict tornadoes and that kind of thing. That's more the meteorology side. And that's what's, what's neat about this Northern Tornadoes project is that we're mixing the engineering with the meteorology. As far as meteorology schools, uh, I went to York University and there's still a good program there. Uh, there's, uh, there's one in Quebec, uh, McGill University. That's, that's probably the top in Canada. Uh, there's a really good severe weather program at University of Manitoba. Um, and they actually have storm chasing courses there, which are, I, I've helped out with. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's part of the program is you learn about storms and then you go on a field trip where you're out storm chasing. And, uh, and I was an, a guest instructor on that. It was, that was quite fun. Uh, so th those are the main schools for, for weather and severe weather. Uh, there are a couple others that offer some, uh, severe, some courses, but not so much focused on severe weather. Uh, but all I can say is get ready to focus on heavy math and, and heavy physics, because in order to get through a meteorology degree, it's it's all about the math and the physics. Yeah, field storm chasing courses. I chose the wrong degree, clearly. <laughs> um, you highlighted something ever so briefly in your talk, and that was uh, the effects of climate on storms. Are we seeing more tornadoes worldwide in Canada, or more you know uh, bigger tornadoes, more devastating tornadoes because of climate change, or what are we finding? Yeah. Uh, one of the problems with trying to get that kind of an answer with tornadoes is that tornadoes are a rare phenomenon, so they don't occur that often. So when you're doing statistics and looking for trends, you usually want a, a big sample size, lots of examples of it so you can get those trends. And with the tornado database that we have, it's just not that big. So that's part of what we're doing with this project is trying to get more tornadoes in the database, high quality tornadoes, so we can get those kinds of trends. In the US, they get more tornadoes, so they've been able to, to do more analysis like that for climate change. And what they found is that uh, there's not necessarily more tornadoes occurring. It's just that when, when tornadoes occur, they tend to occur more in clusters. So there's more, on, on days with tornadoes, there appears to be more, but overall, there's not more tornadoes. Uh, so maybe just a change in the character of how they, 
how they uh, uh, how they occur. Uh, it, it, you know, there's another aspect to it for us in Canada, and that is uh, our, our storm season is fairly short. It usually, you know, come July, August, all of a sudden it really explodes, and and we get severe weather on par with the United States for two months of the year. Um, now, if if we know that with climate change, we're going to get warming. And that means we could extend this, the season in Canada on either side and, and kind of like into September, into May, you know, June, May, June. And if we do expand our severe weather season, that means we're going to end up getting more. So we don't have the statistics to support that at the moment, but that is something that's a concern is that as we get warming, our severe weather season will get longer and then we'll get, we'll end up getting more storms and possibly more tornadoes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the answer. Um, believe it or not, we are going to take one last question. Uh, so Kendra, she wants to know, many of our teachers teach extreme weather in their middle grades. What are some really engaging ways or resources to teach this content with? Oh, okay. Uh, boy, there's just so much content online, but there's, you know, with, there's a lot of jargon, uh, you know, there's, it, it, and it's funny because a lot of, a lot of people that aren't meteorologists can look at all the content online and be, and really become quite good at forecasting tornadoes and, and know all the jargon and all that stuff. Uh, but to try to teach it to middle levels, you got to kind of get away from all that jargon and that's, that's more difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure what resources are out there for that level. It'd be great to have more of it because it's obviously an exciting topic. And I think it is fairly easy to explain uh, on, on a simpler level. It's just that all the resources that I know about online are very technical and all the jargon, and it makes it difficult to, to, uh, to understand. Yeah. Well, as I said uh, in, in the chat bar itself, you know, one of the coolest ways to do that is to have people like you come on and talk about it in such an engaging and exciting way. <laughs> so we really appreciate you joining us today, um, Dr. Sills, and uh, thank you so much for highlighting all your cool work with some really fantastic uh, imagery there. So we really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. For everyone tuning in at home, do check out more storms. Uh, Dr. Sills mentioned George Karunas. We've hosted him for a variety of programs. So if you're keen on amazing weather phenomena, we have more of those videos archived on our YouTube channel. And we look forward to highlighting even more scientists and explorers in the weeks to come. For now, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now, everyone. You too. Take care.